Sir Alexander Seaton, 10th Baronet Seaton, and his wife, Lady Zela, held a dinner party one night in the late autumn of 1936 at their home, 15 Learmonth Gardens, in Edinburgh. During the gathering, Zela told the assembled guests about their trip to Egypt and revealed she'd liberated an ancient bone from a burial site. At this point, her husband retrieved the bone from the former clock case in which it was kept. Unbeknown to them all, it was the beginning of some strange events at the house. The Setons had travelled to Egypt in February 1936, at a time when their marriage was on the rocks. They explored Luxor and the Valley of the Kings, then arrived in Cairo in June. Here they learned of new excavations at a number of small tombs near the Sphinx and they managed to hire a guide and headed out to one of them. It was said Seton wasn't too keen on the idea, but his wife persuaded him, a move he later wished he'd never taken. On a slab at the tomb, the remains of a skeleton of a high-class female were laid out. The skull was pretty much intact, as was the spine, and there were leg bones and a few ribs. After a short time, the couple returned outside, but while Seton had a smoke, his wife returned inside briefly. Later, she told him she'd liberated the bone. When he saw it, he said, it looked like a digestive biscuit, apart from it being slightly convex and the shape of a heart. It was the sacrum, a bone found at the base of the spine. He was dismayed by his wife's grave robbing, but she insisted on keeping it. That night of the dinner party, as the guests were leaving, a heavy piece of masonry fell from the parapet of the property, missing them by just two feet. A few nights later, the Setons were made aware of some noises coming from the drawing room as though someone was walking about, but there was no one in there. On another occasion, the table on which the bone in its clock case sat was discovered to have fallen over, but again, no one had been near it. Often footsteps were heard on the stairs, and in February 1937, when their nephew, nine-year-old Alistair Black, was staying with them for a few days, he told them he'd seen a funny-dressed person going upstairs. The youngster knew nothing of the bone, Seaton would later say. By this time, Seaton thought that their home was being sized up by burglars, so one night he decided to take action. He decided to stay up and watch the house from a balcony of the bedroom. The drawing room door and all the windows were locked tight, and he settled himself in for the night watch. Bored, however, he went to bed and fell asleep. He was roused by his wife and Nanny, their servant, who'd heard loud noises coming from the drawing room. When the door was unlocked, they were met by a surprising scene. Books had been thrown about and chairs were overturned, but the mystery was the door had been locked and no one could have entered via the windows as they too remained locked, and not one was smashed. Perplexed, Seaton had only one explanation. It must have something to do with the Egyptian bone. Over the next few weeks, everything in the house was calm. That was until one night, the strange happenings began again, with the furniture in the drawing room and other items being moved. Seaton decided that the furniture and the bone should be moved down to the sitting room, but this didn't stop what he suspected to be a poltergeist. A week later, noises were heard from the sitting room, and when the door was opened, the furniture had moved, and some had been overturned. He'd had enough. He told his wife he was going to burn the bone, as it was cursed, 
but Lady Seaton was having none of it. It was her memento, and she was keeping it. Angry at her reaction, Seaton stormed out and headed for his club, where he enjoyed a few drinks to quell his temper. During his time there, he spoke of the strange goings-on at his home, but no one believed him except Colonel Evie Coates, and soon, thanks to his loosened tongue, the story was to be found in the local press. He returned some time later, and when he entered the sitting room, to his horror, more damage had been done, and the table on which the case had sat had a large crack in one of the legs. Other phenomena happened in the house. One night a vase containing flowers, which had stood on a table near to where the bone had been placed, was found on the floor, the flowers scattered around six inches away, and no one had been near it. Glass ornaments were shattered, and the mysterious figure Black claimed to have seen was allegedly sighted once more. Fire spontaneously broke out, and the household seemed to come down with illnesses or ailments. Once more things settled for a few weeks, but then the table, the clock case and the bone were found shattered in the sitting room. Everything else was untouched, but Nanny had been scared out of her wits. Lady Zayla was beside herself and ordered the bone to be repaired. By coincidence, the doctor who repaired it later claimed his servant had broken a leg while running away from some kind of mysterious phantom. On Boxing Day 1936, the couple held a dinner party, and it was on this night the most spectacular deed of all took place. The repaired bone sat on a table opposite where the dinner party was taking place. According to Seaton, the entire table, bone and all, went hurtling onto the wall opposite with a terrific thump. No one was standing near it, nor did anyone see it happen. It just happened. It was such an extraordinary event that a female guest a cousin of Zela's, called Gert, and a maid, fainted. It got to the point where the maids refused to stay in the house overnight. In March 1937, it was reported in newspapers that Lady Zela was going to return to Egypt to replace the stolen bone. But it never happened, nor was there any indication from the Setons that this was the case. The following month, Seaton went to a meeting at the Edinburgh Psychic College in Heriot Row. He explained what had been happening and told the crowd, I am absolutely and entirely open-minded, and I want to say I refuse to be drawn into any controversy because these things have taken place that I cannot explain. He later said, There is one thing I am dead certain of. Somehow, I am trying to get this bone back. I have to believe now that this bone has something behind it. There is something in the curse of the pharaohs. He went on to tell them that something similar to the vase incident had happened the week before this meeting. He had been alone in the house as his wife was at the theatre with friends. He'd gone upstairs to do some writing when he heard a thump from the drawing room and when he entered, he saw one of the chairs completely upside down, and the table had been moved four inches from the wall. The vase had landed eight feet from the table. After speaking at the meeting, he went to an overflow meeting downstairs, as a clairvoyant, Mrs Bardman from London, took the platform. Her face became flushed, and she didn't speak immediately. She apologised to the audience, but said, I feel that that bone should be got away in the next six weeks. She said that if it didn't, blindness would come to those who touch it. 
Members of the press caught Seaton as he was returning from the overflow meeting and told him what had just happened. He told them he couldn't immediately return to Egypt and offered it to one of them, as he had the bone on him at the time, but they refused. A few weeks later, a new glass case holding the bone was smashed, the bone found eight feet away, and a vase smashed once more. On Wednesday 19th May at around five o'clock in the morning, Seaton heard a crash and found the glass case holding the bone smashed to pieces. The two feet long case had been made from thick glass and was bound by stout copper bands which had been completely twisted. It was thought it would take quite some force to destroy it. The bone itself was badly damaged, with some of it reduced to powder. I think we've seen the end of it all, said Seaton in a press statement. I know there are some people who will say it's a lot of nonsense, and probably, if I were in their position, I would be inclined to take that view myself. But how can you explain it? Asked what he was going to do with the remains of the bone, he said, I'm going to put the bone and the fragments of the case in a box and give them a decent burial. Seaton called his uncle, Father Benedict, of the Fort Augustus Abbey and asked him to exorcise the bone. According to Seaton, it was a solemn visit, carried out when his wife was absent. Once the bone had been blessed, it was duly burned. There were no further mysterious happenings at the Seaton home, although Lady Seaton was furious and never forgave her husband for destroying it. Seaton and his wife divorced in 1939, and just four days later, on 17th June, he married Flavia Forbes. They divorced in 1959, and he went on to marry Julia Clements in July 1962. He died the following year, aged 59.